Happy Valentine's Day. Have you made it special yet? You know, I know that the, the day is hardly over. It's still young. Well, as believers, we need to celebrate the love of God all the time, every day, because we as children of God, his people, need to express that love to those around us, others, especially in our home, especially in our family, especially to our spouse. Okay, I got a question for you. What's the Valentine's Day flower? Rose, is that what you think? You think it's a rose? I got news for you. It's the daisy. (laughs) At least in my illustration, it is. Are we ready? She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. I'm going to propose to her today. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. Oh, I'll accept that proposal if he proposes to me. It must be God's will. No. Or, she loves me. She loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. Yeah, I'm going to go for that divorce. They don't love me. She doesn't love me. He doesn't love me anymore. See, I got proof. That might be how society looks at marriage. Loves me, loves me not, loves me, loves me not. How do I feel today? I don't know. It's not that way, and it must not be that way for us as followers of Jesus Christ. We better not view marriage nor divorce that way. I was told by someone who saw the topic for this morning, and it wasn't Lisa, and she said, you're going to preach on divorce on Valentine's Day? Why not marriage? And I said, well, I I guess I could start in Matthew chapter 19. That's what we're going to do next week. But the text is chapter 5 for this week. Now, if you know me, you might say, well, that's that's what Bubar is. That's just all he's like. He's got to follow the plan. Next week, we'll see what could be Valentine's Day. Next week, that's when we're going to look at the permanence of marriage. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus went from addressing adultery to lust to divorce, and we go, hmm, we all know the devastating effects of divorce. Some of you are children of divorce. Other of us have been through the ripping effect of divorce. We know divorce impacts loved ones, our loved ones, our friends. So we as believers, that's why this message is for all of us. We as believers need to know what God's word says about marriage and about divorce because I'm sure we've got family members and loved ones and friends who are going through those kind of situations that we better know how to give them God's answer. We need to do that. Unfortunately, we live in a society that thinks, ah, well, if your marriage isn't what you thought it would be, or you fall in love with somebody else, just get a divorce. No big deal. And you shell out a few hundred dollars, and bingo, you got your divorce. And then it's on to the next marriage. And then someone says, so what's the big deal about marriage? Why even get married? Do you know what the new definition of fiancé is? Lisa and I, every time we hear it talked about on television, there it is. You know what the new definition of fiancé is? We're living together, but we are committed to get married sometime. That's what it is. That's our society. Now, in contrast, there are some within the Christian world that think divorce is the unpardonable sin. And we hear words, the true words, written by the prophet Malachi, spoken by God, for I hate divorce, the Lord Yahweh says, and he does. And I'm not minimizing the sin of unbiblical divorce and the impact of any divorce. But I think we might know, as in Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 6, that God hates more than just divorce. How many of those sins capture us? How many of those sins are we guilty of? The Lord hates all sin. And I'm a sinner. And so are you. However, it's true that some of our sins are more impacting and more destructive than other sins. I want to remind you at the beginning of this message that throughout my message this morning on divorce, 
that we need to be truthful about what God says about this action. But we also need to be willing to extend grace and love according to God's word. We need to call sin, sin. We always need to do that. And when any of us sin, what do we do? We need to confess our sin, turn from our sin, repent of our sin, run away from that. There's always consequence to sin, true? It can be forgiven and cleansed, but there's still consequences. And sometimes the consequences are inconsequential, correct? Sometimes the consequences are huge. And so when there's genuine repentance, how should the body of Christ respond to genuine repentance? We should respond with love and grace. In preparation for this marriage, I did enough reading on divorce and the impact of divorce, and I got a bunch of articles, and I'm just going to read four or five bullet points. Fascinating family statistics, separation statistics. 36.6 of all marriages in the U.S. end in divorce. Roughly one in two children will see their parents' marriage break up. 21% of children are being raised without their fathers in America. Children are more likely to experience behavior issues when parents divorce when the child is between the ages 7 and 14. We sent out a survey last couple weeks, and I wanted to find out how we, the chapel, are impacted by divorce. I want to thank those of you who filled out that survey and got it back in. Uh, It wasn't hard, just two questions. First question was, my immediate family has been impacted by or touched by divorce, yes or no? And the second question, you know, my extended family has been touched by divorce, yes or no? Well, here we are, all 232 of us who responded. What are those circles? So what do you think? How many of us in our immediate families have been touched by divorce? You ready? Got a number in mind? How many? 150. That's 65% of us in our immediate family have been infected, touched by divorce. But how how extensive is divorce? How widespread is the impact? Touching our extended family. Out of those 232, it was 218 who have been touched by divorce in their extended family. There's a lot of red up there. That's 94%. 94% of us, our extended families, have been impacted by divorce. You think of the impact. Think of the impact on children. Think of the impact on families. Think of the impact on parents. Think of the impact on how are we going to do Christmas this year? I don't know. Certainly the statistics of two out of three is significant. But nine out of ten? Think of that impact. So what do we do as believers, as followers of Jesus today? This isn't about condemning those who are divorced at all. Christ isn't condemning those who are divorced with right cause, nor should we. We know that Jesus extends grace to all who come to him with a repentant heart. Yes? And so should we. If the reason for your divorce isn't biblical, then you are surely needing to confess that as sin and have a right heart with the Lord. And maybe you made things right with the Lord a long time ago. You know, we can't change our past. It's sad but true. I can't can't do anything about what happened seven years ago or 27 years ago. This morning, we need to see what Jesus does teach about this prevalent issue that has impacted society thousands of years so that we can live lives that are pleasing to him, so that we would help one another who might be struggling in their marriage or in a divorce. Please take your Bibles, turn to our text, Matthew chapter 5, and we need to see what Jesus taught here and how it's connected with what he just talked about in the previous paragraph, which is lust, as the word adultery is used in both of those portions. Take a look at the end of verse 28 and the end of verse 32. And the Lord's conclusion is the same. The result of lust is adultery of the heart. The result of unbiblical divorce and remarriage is actual adultery. But let's remember that through confession and genuine repentance, all sin is 
forgivable and forgiven by our loving, gracious, heavenly Father. Friends, that's why Jesus went to the cross. If you got your outline, the first point I want us to look at and think about is divorce in society. Verse 31, Jesus said, it's been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Point A, divorce, it is and was and it's so prevalent. Point one, it was prevalent in the Old Testament days and times. Jesus refers to this certificate of divorce. Take your Bibles now, flip back to Deuteronomy, fifth book in the, in the Bible. And Deuteronomy chapter 24, and Moses is writing here, and he says, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, the word displeasing here, as seen from other usages, has the idea of, of anything that's improper, shameful. It does mean nakedness. But it cannot refer to adultery. Displeasing does not refer to adultery here. For if the wife is guilty of, divorce, uh, of adultery, she would not be given a certificate of divorce. She would be put to death. Correct? That certificate of divorce was given so that it would say the reason for her divorce, and it's not adultery. Going further in the text, the certificate, it allows her to remarry. So with that certificate of divorce, which proves that indeed she's divorced, she's free to remarry, it's pointed out that in Jewish culture, it's the woman divorce, most likely to remarry, because that would really be her only means of support. In verse 3, the point of this text, let's look at it. It centers on the prohibition that the first husband who divorces a wife cannot remarry her because she's now defiled. That's what the text says. You see it? Now, why is she defiled? And it's because the basis for the divorce is not acceptable to the Lord, but it is allowable. Not acceptable, but allowable by God, which certainly points to the grace and mercy for this woman, for women. It's what happens in the second marriage that disqualifies her from not remarrying anyone. She could remarry somebody else, but from remarrying her first husband. She's not to marry, remarry that first husband. Divorced women were remarried in Israel. So Moses wrote that being married to her, the first husband again would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Therefore, what's the point? What is he saying here? Men, do not make light of your marriage. Men, work on your marriages. What we see, need to see, is that this is not a judgment on the wife at all. Rather, this is really about the husband and his divorcing his wife for any reason other than adultery. And now he wants her back as her own because she's been set free from the next marriage that she was in, either by divorce or, or uh, death. So why can't I remarry her and have her back? But he cannot. And the certificate that she is to receive becomes the means of the protection of the woman so that she can demonstrate that it's, she's not guilty of adultery. Thus, she cannot be falsely accused. And indeed, divorce was there in the day of Moses. And Moses is not encouraging divorce, but he's not forbidding it either. He certainly is discouraging a man, a husband, from being hasty or frivolous in a divorce, in his marriage. The prevalence of divorce, point two, let's look at the first century, the day of Jesus. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 19, and we're going to step into this text next Sunday. And in verse three, we see some of the Pharisees come to Jesus to trick him. The word test within the context can mean to trick. And they're there to trick him, to trap him. And they ask, is it lawful for a man to, to divorce his wife for any and every reason, Jesus? So what's going on in Israel? In the Lord's day, there were two rabbinic schools of thought. There was the conservative view, that which Jesus would hold to and did hold to, and that the only grounds for divorce was adultery. There was a second school of thought, the liberal school. It was the popular 
school of thought of divorce, as is today, and that you can divorce your wife for any and every reason you got. Many reasons were found in historic writings. One literally said, she burned biscuits. So ladies, do not burn the biscuits. That's literally true. Next Sunday, we're going to look at Jesus and how he comes back at them, declaring the permanence of marriage. That marriage bond, really, it's the welding together that cannot be in separate. You know, if you separate a, a weld, it's not broken at the weld point. It's breaking someplace else, and you've got a fragment, don't you? Verse 7 of our Matthew 19. They bring up the divorce certificate. In verse 8, Jesus said that God allowed divorce for reasons other than adultery. Why? Because of the sinful hearts of God's people. But it was not this way from the beginning, Jesus said. In verse 9, Jesus states so similarly to what we have in our text in Matthew chapter 5. What we need to see here is that by the first century, the Jews were divorcing their wives for any and every reason. They didn't like their wife, displeased with her in any way, they divorced her. It was also true in just like the culture of the Greco-Roman society. So in Jewish culture or Greeks or Romans in any of their cultures, it, it, for them, love, love wasn't an issue in marriage. It was a legal cohabitation agreement. And thus, divorce could happen for any reason as well. However, what's mentioned most in Greco-Roman writing is for adultery. The adultery on the part of the, on the wife. or uh, 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 She is expected to be faithful. The husband was not expected to be faithful. Point three. We need to see the prevalence in our day, today's day. Michigan, we have what is called, right, no-fault divorce, which means uh, you can divorce whether the spouse wants that divorce or not, and you can't contest the divorce. Divorce has been and still is everywhere. Well, not only is it prevalent, but also we know point B, that divorce is destructive. We, we, exp we see that. Uh, I read you just a few of the statistics on the impacts of divorce. Most of us know in our extended families, when there's divorced family members, it's, 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 it's hard. And what do we do? And how do we handle it? And, and, and we know that there's hurt and there's pain. We've seen that. Think of the impact of divorce on what it's going through, especially if it's the husband who files or sues for divorce. Think of the wife, I think. The changes that take place. The financial and work changes. The emotional hurt, anger, grief. The altered social relationships. You think about that. Now that there's a divorce, we had friends together, and now what happens? And it's hard, and this all changes, and there can be loneliness, and there can be feeling of rejection and a loss of any self-esteem, and, and sometimes there's unwanted independence, and, and then there's raising children alone, and, and there's shared time of your kids, and how does that all go? But through it all, sometimes it's what does happen, must happen, all because of the hardness of a heart. Isn't that what Jesus said? It's because of sin. My contribution, my wife's contribution. Maybe my refusal to confess my sin, and I don't care anymore, and I don't want a right heart with the Lord. And I've heard those stories. You know, we cannot control our spouse's behavior. We can't control their walk with the Lord. We can't control their heart. But we better make sure our heart is right with the Lord. Secondly, point two, divorce in Scripture. Point A, marriage is meant to be permanent until death. There's a number of Scriptures that are listed there. We'll look at a little bit about that next Sunday. Point B, divorce is allowed by God. When is it allowed by God? Let's take a look at God's Word. Point one, divorce is not allowed for any reason, right? We see that. There was this trap, it was the trap that the Pharisees laid for Jesus in Matthew 19. And, and again, today you can divorce your wife or husband for any reason. You don't need a reason. You just don't want to be married to that person anymore. And that's wrong, and that's sinful. However, point two, divorce is allowed for sexual sin or on a marital unfaithfulness. Now, there are evangelicals who don't agree with that, and I understand that, but there are 
many of us who do, and this is where I come down on divorce, in our text, in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 19, Jesus gives, this, or Jesus gives an exception clause, right? And so you've got to deal with it. It's there. We need to remember that in the parallel Gospels, Mark and Luke, neither one of them uh, give this exception clause. It's just straight out. So why does Matthew choose to include this exception clause? Right, that's the question. No one's questioning the fact that Jesus spoke it. Jesus said this, and he would have taught these things on marriage and divorce many times, not just one sermon on the mount, not just with the Pharisees in chapter 19. He would have, this would have been a part of his teaching. The word used here is a Greek word translated into English. It gives us porn, pornea. It's a general term for sexual sin of, of many kinds, and it does include adultery. It can mean sexual relationships before you're married, but it's certainly not limited to that. Focusing on marriage, I agree with those who take this word to mean that if a spouse has any sexual relationship outside the bond of marriage, adultery, homosexuality, some perversion, as a married person, that would constitute this word pornea. It's significant that Matthew chooses not to use the word specifically ad adultery, but this more general term. Any sexual sin violates the one nature, the one bond nature of marriage. And that's important to see. The key question is, well, why didn't Mark and Luke include that exception clause? The reason being that every dominant culture, Jewish, Greek, Roman, all of them gave the exception that Jesus spoke there that you can always divorce because of adultery or sexual sin. That would not be debated. Sexual sin breaks the bond of marriage in, in, in the day of Moses. But the punishment was not a certificate of divorce. It would be put to death, right? And so when the death of a spouse, the bond of marriage is broken and the survivor is free to marry. So too is sexual sin. That's what we would see in the Gospels come first century. Pastor John MacArthur, pastors uh, out on the West Coast and great writer commentaries that he puts out. Here's what he says here, quote, The divorced adulterer is as good as dead in the eyes of the Lord. The day of Moses, the adulterer was put to death. Right? Therefore, the innocent spouse, the non-adulterous spouse indeed is free to remarry as would the widower free to remarry. So Mark and Luke choose not to put the clause in because that was assumed by society. Matthew puts it in because he wants to make sure that he clears up in Israel the debated two rabbinic schools, one that said for any reason and one that said for, for sexual sin only. So Matthew's coming down on that. Second possible argument for Divorce, biblical divorce, would be point three. The divorce is allowed in the desertion of an unbelieving spouse. And we'll look at that when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 next month. Now I want us to see point four. Remarriage is always possible when there's a biblical divorce. You go back to uh, Matthew chapter 5 verse 32. Let me make this clear. Jesus is saying that without a sexual violation of marriage... If you divorce and remarry at that point, you become an adulterer. Read those verses, look at it. And here Jesus is pointing his finger at the husband. And you divorce your wife and she remarries, which probably out of great necessity that she did in that culture. You, the husband, you're the cause of her becoming an adulteress. That's what Jesus is saying. And the man who marries that woman has become an adulterer. And, of course, the same would be true if it was flip-flopped, if a woman divorced his, the, the, um, the husband, except for marital unfaithfulness, and the husband remarries, and so on. But that situation you're not going to find in Israel in the first century. Now, if this has, one has biblical grounds for divorce, then there are biblical grounds for remarriage. And you are not committing adultery in that new marriage. Remember, the certificate of divorce gave the right for remarriage. However, Jesus is saying, you don't get a certificate of divorce for, for any reason. The only justifiable reason for that certificate is because of sexual sin. Sexual violation. 
Back to 1 Corinthians 7, I agree with those who contend that Paul is saying that, that the unbeliever who divorces the believing wife, that believing spouse has biblical grounds for divorce and thus a valid ground for remarriage. We all need to see that divorce is always about the grace of God because no one's put to death for that. There's not a capital offense. Point C, divorce is never commanded in God's word. Let's see that. The, what's, what's the greatest is reconciliation and repentance and forgiveness, and that's a picture from the Lord. But that doesn't mean there won't be a divorce. Surely the issue of trust has to be resolved in that broken marriage. Sin, outside of sexual sin, which Jesus here is speaking about, sin in general cannot be grounds for divorce. Otherwise, you have divorce for many, many reasons. Indeed, we have to think through this issue of abuse. Is abuse biblical grounds for divorce? I guess if you, you, know, if you made the case of who would be abusive like this, would that person, he claims to be a Christian, or she does, but how can they really be a believer if they would do that? You could make that case, I guess. But where there is abuse, boy, get out, call the police, press charges. Not easy. Last point, my application. And I've got some positives here. Uh, let's look at divorce and the church, point three. So here's my Valentine's message. It's more positive. Point A, let's be reconciling. That's my call for all of us as believers. In all of life, in all the situations, let's work towards reconciliation. This is, I'm not just talking marriage. I'm talking about in life as a believer. But reconciliation is hard. Reconciliation is difficult. I don't say this without thought. The greatest step that anyone can take in any relationship, a relationship that is broken, maybe more than that, splintered, probably more than that. What if it's a relationship that has been pounded into sawdust? That spattered relationship, the greatest thing that we can do is seek reconciliation, putting it back together. Is that possible? Only in the power of the Holy Spirit. Only when both people are ready. Because reconciliation takes two people coming back together. Now the beauty in our walk with the Lord is that, that our Lord is always open for reconciliation, right? His arms are always out to us saying, come on, come back to me, come back to me, come back to me. And it's us stupid people, stubborn people, who have turned away from him. But when we repent and turn back to him, our Lord is there with open arms. That's how it is in our relationship with the Lord. That's not how it always is with other human beings. I can't make anybody turn around in, their, in, in, in how they feel towards me. You can't do that either. But I can make sure my heart is right, and that's what I'm asking. In marriage and relationship, it takes two to be reconciled. Point B, let's be forgiving. There's no question that we as believers are to forgive. And why must we forgive? Why must we be forgiving? How about Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32? If our God, holy, infinitely holy, can come down to forgive us as wretched sinners, and there really isn't any difference in how spread out sinners are. We're all wretched people. And if this holy God can come down and forgive me in my sin, how can this sinner not forgive another sinner and another sinner who's right up shoulder to shoulder with me with no distance? If God has forgiven me, I am to forgive you. Forgiveness is commanded of us in Scripture. It's not easy to forgive. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying any of this is easy. I'm just sharing God's word with you. We're to be obedient no matter how hard it is. In our struggles in marriage, and we all have them, we're to be forgiving over and over and over and over. Are there issues that we've got to go back to and address in our marriage? Sure there are. There always would be. We need to get help with that. Any of us pastors would love to talk with you. 
God World Christian Counselor. We have a counseling relationship with Southwest Medical Clinic Christian Counseling Center. Call them. Get an appointment. We at the chapel, if you're a part of the chapel, we have a, we have a relationship, two free sessions with them. Dealing with sinful issues is different than forgiveness. We get that? Dealing with the issue is different than forgiveness. We're commanded to forgive. We might not make any headway on the issue because the issue will take two of us and I can't control the other person. I've got to forgive in my marriage. But I might also need to say some tough love. Dobson has a book on tough love. And we might need to say, clean up your act, get it together, period, I guess. <laughs> if there's sin in our marriages, let's do something about it today. Valentine's Day, confess it, turn from it, repent of it. If there's been adultery, does a person think that they're going to get away with it. How long will that? How long does anyone get away with adultery before it breaks open, found out? That sin is impacting, destroying marriages. That's, if that's something you need to talk with, talk to an elder, talk to one of our pastors, go to a Christian counselor, talk to your spouse, work it out, face the consequences, which will, could be horrible. We've got to be committed. To forgiveness. And forgiveness is never easy. It costs Jesus his life. But again, forgiveness and reconciliation are two different issues. Point C, let's possess a right mindset. Marriage, in marriage, there's no escape route, escape door. You know, we might think when we get married that there's always that possibility if it doesn't work, we can get out of this marriage bond. There's nothing I don't, I can't. I can get out of it. I can imagine that as a couple walks down the aisle, maybe they think they're never going to get a divorce, but maybe they think in the back of their heads, I can always get out. And so after we have our fights in our marriage, and we say, well, let's stay together for the sake of our kids, but when the kids are out of the house, we're done. There's others who say, well, we don't love each anymore, and there's a mutualness to that. We don't love each anymore. Well, let's get out of this marriage and go on to somebody else. I often tell couples in my premarital counseling with them, we, you got to look at yourself. When you get married, you're in a room that's locked, and there's no doors, and there's no windows, but it is well padded. <laughs> and when you get tired enough of yelling and screaming, and tired enough of beating your fists against the table in there, and you finally enough of this, you sit down at the table because there's no escape route. And you sit down and negotiate. You sit down and talk. You sit down and say, we got to make this thing work because we can't get out of it. That's the mindset of marriage. We always should be saying, what can we do to make this better? What can we do to make this work? That has to be who we are. There's a great book by Ed Wheat called Love Life for Every Married Couple, 15th chapter, How to Save Your Marriage Alone. There are things we can do. We need that mindset. Point D, we got to build strong marriages and realize that it takes work. It takes selflessness, and it takes selfless love, and it takes effort, and it takes communication, and it takes forgiveness. And it means we're blending our lives together, and we got to talk about that. We need to have conversations to say, what can we do to improve our marriage? And stop the stubbornness. Be thinking, who is a couple can we impact for Christ? I had a couple back in Pennsylvania who were just, I married them. And, and, and I, was with, I led the guy to Christ. And, and, and they were, it was terrible. And they were screaming and yelling. And he tried to run her down the car. They were in the house. And she pulled a knife. And I get called into this thing. And they're both steaming. And, and so I purposely match them. Sometimes I do that. When they're screaming, I can scream just as loud as they can to get them to sit down. And I say, what do you think your neighbors think of this mess? Basically what I said to them. They did end up getting divorced, but it wasn't while I was still there. I told them, you need, instead of setting this kind of an example with your neighbors, you need to go build a relationship with them and have them over and talk to them about Jesus because they don't know Jesus, but they probably don't want your Jesus. 
we need a project. All of us in our marriages need a project to say, what can we do together for the sake of the kingdom? That's what we've got to be thinking about. You do that, and you will not be at war with each other. You're going to be thinking, what can we do for the sake of Jesus? Last point. Point E, we've got, we got to be accepting and loving of divorced people. A long time ago, I read, a, I read a writing that included divorce struggles of believers who were divorced because of adultery. And they wrote how the church turned their back and friends turned their back. Believers did that and the devastation. I love our church. So many of you do it right. You are welcoming to hurting people. Thank you for doing that. We're not a perfect church. Far from that. I know someone could walk into this building, especially pre-COVID days and post-COVID days when we get there, and someone can walk in and go, well, they weren't very friendly to me. No one talked to me. No one even introduced themselves, and the pastor walked right by me. And You know, that can happen. That can happen too many times. But we don't want it to happen, and we try so it doesn't happen. As a church, I thank you for those of you who are caring about hurting people. And when it comes to sin, listen, we have to address the issues of sin. We do that as a church. We do that from this pulpit. We do that as staff. We want sinners to come to this church. You know why? Because I'm here and you're here. We're sinners. We want all sinners to come to this church. Because we have a message that needs to be heard by all people who are separated from Jesus because of their sin. They need to hear that Jesus loves you and he died for you and he paid the price for your sin. Your sin separates you from God and you face eternity in hell. But Jesus died so that could be forgiven and you can be forgiven. All your sin. Be brought into a right relationship with God and become a child of God. Do you need to make that decision even today? We want people to come as believers who are living in sin. And we don't want believers living in sin not to come. We want to come. I want them to come because I want them to be cared for and loved because I want them to hear that, that there's a call to repent and have your heart right with the Lord. And that's the only way that God will bless you in your life. We need to hear that truth, but we also need to express the grace of God to people. As to divorce, divorce is sinful. If there aren't biblical grounds for divorce, But all sin is forgivable when we take the right steps and come to Christ confessing our sin. If you've gone through a divorce, I trust that you feel accepted here. Also trust that you've taken right steps to be right with the Lord. That you've dealt with that sin. Maybe you have a long time ago. And if you have, then you're right with the Lord. But if you haven't taken those steps to be right with the Lord, let's do that today. Have a heart that's right with him. And that needs to be true for all of us. I want us to bow for prayer. Has bowed. And let me just talk to different groupings of us. For all of us. Ask yourself, is my heart right with you, Lord? Show me my sin that I need to confess and turn from. Would you pray that? To those of us who are not married, I'm asking you to make that commitment to be pure of heart. No sex until you're married. If you're good in that life of singleness, be a testimony for Jesus. You got friends who are married, friends that are divorced, help them see what they need to know. If you're single and you... Sometime down the road, you marry. Marry only a believer. Marriage is for keeps. Pray about that. Would you do that? To those of us who are married, we need to be pure of heart. We need to work on our marriages. We need to live out our faith every day. Is there anything you can do today to make your marriage stronger? Is there sin in your marriage of any kind that you need to confess to the Lord? Would you do that? Do that right now. To those who have been divorced and remarried, make sure that if there's any sin on your past of that marriage, first marriage, second, third marriage, confess it. Make sure you're right with the Lord on that. Maybe you've dealt with it long ago. 
Have a godly marriage today. Do everything you can to honor the Lord in that marriage. Work on your marriage. And tell yourself that commitment, no divorce again. Pray about that. If you're divorced and you're single, be fully devoted to the Lord. Maybe you didn't ask for that divorce. Maybe much of it was about the unfaithfulness of a spouse. And that marriage may be over, but you still need a right heart even if you've been hurt or betrayed. We still have to be forgiving no matter the outcome. Would you pray about that? If the divorce is a result of your unfaithfulness, again, seek things, think, make it right. Maybe you have. Remember that we cannot undo, we can't, we wish we could go back and change things and we can't, so we have to trust the Lord for today and for tomorrow. Would you do that? I imagine there could be someone thinking about getting divorced. Would you rethink it? Don't go there. What does the Lord want from you? Seek godly counsel. Call any of us pastors, we would be happy to talk with you. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, I, I haven't stepped into that personal relationship with Jesus. How about today? Right now? And you pray silently and you say, Jesus, I need you to be my Savior, to rescue me from my sin. I know, Jesus, you died to pay the penalty of my sin. So cleanse me. Forgive me. Today I receive your gift of salvation. And Jesus, I surrender my life to you. If that's your prayer, let me know, let any of our staff know we would love to talk with you. We come to the Lord knowing our hearts, having confessed and repented of any known sin. Oh, in our lives, sometimes sin runs deep. <laughs> Paul writes in Romans, where the sin runs deep, there's always grace to cover it. And in Christ, we find his forgiveness, and we find the rest that we need. We're going to sing those truths. Let's stand, and let's do that.